For regular videos on ancient cultures and forgotten civilizations, please subscribe. The sponsor of today's video is Skillshare, an online learning community with thousands of great classes geared towards personal growth and development. And as the name suggests, learning new skills. New premium classes are launched every week. When you first join, you'll be asked what subjects interest you. But there are all kinds of subjects available. Are you a student? There's a course here on exactly how to study for an exam. Maybe you like photography and illustration or graphic design or gardening or just self-care and relaxation. There's something here for everybody. Lately, I've been trying my hand at Moroccan food by watching the class Learning the Art of Cooking a Culinary Masterpiece, Traditional Moroccan Food with Aliyah al Kasimi. Look at this briwat. Mmm, yeah. Now, below this video is a link and the first 1,000 people to click on that link will get one month free trial of Skillshare. So it's a great time to take advantage of this opportunity. Historians of ancient times love it when archeologists dig up inscriptions. Whether it be a clay tablet in the ruins of a palace or a papyrus found in a tomb, these are, for us, what we probably love the most. Because after all, history is the study of documents. But sometimes, inscriptions are discovered that cannot be read, not because they're in poor shape necessarily, although that happens too, but because we don't know how to read them. Yes, I'm talking about ancient scripts that are undeciphered. We cannot translate them. Fortunately, through study, scripts that were formerly unreadable, like Mesopotamian cuneiform, Mycenaean Linear B, or Egyptian hieroglyphs, now are but there still are many today that remain untranslated. So today I want to walk you through some of the more interesting, undeciphered scripts. The other day I had a chance to speak on the subject with Dr. Mark Newbrook over Zoom. He has a BA in Classics and a PhD in Linguistics. Mark is the author of the fascinating book, Strange Linguistics, A Skeptical Linguist Looks at Non-Mainstream Ideas About Language. So I will play you sections of our conversation throughout the video as we discuss the various scripts, because I think you're going to enjoy it. Take a look at this ancient script. Do you recognize it? It comes from inscriptions that have been discovered from the Minoan civilization, centered on the island of Crete in the Mediterranean Sea, which flourished between 2000 and 1100 BCE. It's called Linear A, and there are at least 1400 inscriptions written in it. We can't read it, and we don't even know what language it represents. If the inscriptions could be translated, there would be much about the Minoan culture that would come to light. Some progress has been made recently on it, and that is tantalizing, but we've still got a long way to go. Another script from the island of Crete comes from the Phaistos disc. I discussed this artifact in detail in another video. Check it out if you haven't seen it yet. But I thought I should mention it in connection with Minoan writing, and as it's believed to come from around the same time. However, it's different than Linear A, and sadly, the disc is our only known representation of it. So, unless we find more examples of this script, it's unlikely we will ever know for sure if any decipherment of it is correct. While we're talking about the Minoans, I should probably mention the Cipro-Minoan syllabary found on the island of Cyprus. It carries features very similar to Linear A, so there appears to be a connection. About 250 inscriptions have been found in this script. If Linear A is ever deciphered, perhaps our chances of cracking this one will be greater. But let's hear what Mark has to say about these Minoan scripts. All right, I have with me here Mark Newbrook, who is the author of Strange Linguistics. He, he refers to himself as a skeptical linguist. Mark, what does that mean exactly, a skeptical linguist? Um, well, I've got a foot in two camps. I'm a linguist, a professional linguist on the one hand. And on the other, I'm a member of the worldwide skeptical community represented in the US by CSI, by the West Coast Skeptics at Caltech and represented in this country by two organizations. And I apply the methods of, of skeptical reasoning and scrutiny to the subject of linguistics, to claims made by amateurs and mavericks about language matters, which may well not hold up. Okay. Uh, before we get into the specific examples, I probably should ask you this, and that is, um, how can you tell if somebody deciphered a script correctly or not? People can just come up with a theory, and then how do you know if it's right? Well, one example of this was Linear B in Crete, 
which Michael Ventris and John Chadwick deciphered as very early Greek. And one of the strongest points in the favor of that decipherment was that they came upon forms which had been predicted by philologists as existing in earlier Greek. And they came upon those very forms. And Ventris himself was not a philologist. He didn't know that. So it was very good confirming evidence that they were on the right track. Now, there are other cases where it's much harder to be sure whether we have a decipherment or not. And in many of those cases, mainstream linguists will say, it's up in the air. We don't know yet. There could be various decipherments. In some cases, we seem to have no clue. But in the better cases like that, we can find confirming evidence of the decipherment. I see. So there's some possible decipherments out there that could be true, could be right, but mm. we're, we just can't know at this point. And in some cases, there are very many decipherments out there. For example, Indus Valley script, over 100 decipherments have been proposed, many of them by non-linguists or mavericks. And you know, it's very difficult to know in which direction to take that. But in some cases, that there's only one, one or two decipherments or, or nothing at all, as I say at the moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, well, let's talk about some specific examples. Um, and maybe we should group the first three together because they're kind of related, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, linear A, uh, the Feistos disk, and the Cipro uh, Minoan syllabary. <laughs> well, let, let's go one by one. But I think they mm -hmm. could, some people have supposed they might be somehow related, but. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I mean, All right, let's talk about linear A. We, you, you mentioned that we've deciphered yeah. linear B. If we know how to read linear B, why can't we just use that to read linear A? Well, if, if we're right in thinking linear B represents Greek, and then we try to ascribe the sounds of the characters to linear A, we don't get anything resembling Greek. So unless the characters have different values, which they could do, but of course we wouldn't know what those values were, it's almost certainly not Greek although some people have claimed that it's Greek. Um, it's, it is an earlier script. It appears that Linear B developed out of Linear A. There's a 50-year period where neither is found in the record. The various claims that have been made about Linear A, uh, uh, um, Cyrus Gordon, uh, an American linguist, who went a bit feral, should we say, towards the end of his career, he decided it was Ugaritic, which is West Semitic. But this is a scholar who decided that a certain stone found in Brazil was written in Phoenician. And some people think that's not very likely. And he hasn't ah. been able to convince others. So it's linear. The language of linear A is sometimes called Minoan or Minoan. But that's just a placeholder referring to the, the mythology about early Crete, King Minos and the, and the Minotaur and so forth. Um, all this, the, 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 this is a much earlier period than classical Greek, obviously. The, the later Greek alphabet has a completely different source, and it appears there was quite a long period when literacy disappeared in Greece, and then it was revived with the alphabet later. But linear A remains a mystery. We don't know what language it represents. Wow. And um, the, I, I actually had someone on here talking about the Feistos disk a couple of months ago. Um, now, is there any connection between that and linear A? Uh, the characters don't resemble linear A characters very closely at all. Um, the, the disc is 16 centimeters in diameter. It was found in 1908 by French and Italian archaeologists. And it's got an inscription on both sides, which appears to spiral in from the rim to the center, although some people read it the other way. There's 240 characters uh, representing 45 types. They're divided into groups by radial lines, broken radial lines. Uh, what's exciting is the characters were impressed with cut punches, it seems, when the, when the clay was soft. They're not carved. And so every token of a given type is almost identical. So this is almost like printing. It's a very interesting finding. Some people think it's a modern forgery. So far, the Greek authorities have refused to allow thermoluminescence analysis, which might resolve that. Um, Lots of people have interpreted it in various ways. Many people think it's probably a, a syllabic writing system like linear A and linear B, where each character represents a syllable. Often it will be a consonant plus a vowel. But other people have made all kinds of proposals. Um, one, one proposal that's found some favor is that it might represent Luwian, an important language of, of Anatolia, of what's now Asian Turkey. 
Mm -hmm. And some people think that's what the Trojans spoke. There's one very short inscription found on the site of Troy, which appears to be in Luwian. But we don't know. It, there's mm -hmm. all kinds of possible claims. But it's, it's found on Crete, so it, it, it at least shows that there's, there's more than one script being used on mm. Crete, right? Yeah, but it's the only example of its type. I mean, mm. you find the, the occasional Indus Valley script tablet in Mesopotamia. But that could be because of trade. It doesn't mean it was actually uh, being actively yeah, yeah, used yeah. there. If we had more tokens like the Festos disc, we might, even the absence of something like a Rosetta Stone, we'd get a larger text. We'd have more chance of working out what language it might be. Even before Linear B was deciphered as Greek, it was understood that it was a language of that type with mm -hmm. grammatical endings and so forth. But the text is too short. And most people who looked at it believe that it's too short ever to be deciphered unless we get a chance finding or, or a longer text. Mm -hmm. So then any claims that to have deciphered it, um, you have to take with a grain of salt because there's no way to actually uh, demonstrate that, right? <laughs> Some of them are more sophisticated than others, but then they haven't been able to convince people. And there's a whole lot of rank amateurs who have often quite wild theories about it. Some of them connected with non-standard accounts of prehistory things like atlantis and so forth so at the moment we again as with linear a we simply don't know and now uh, the cipro minoan syllabary um i think might have also been discovered by arthur evans i, I can't mm -hmm. recall now um so uh, how is how is this connected do you think to the linear a or, or something like that there's a certain sharing of some of the characters or an apparent sharing with Linear A, but there's 250 objects, but some of them are very short inscriptions indeed, like a little seal or something. So we don't have very much data. And so, uh, again, we, we only think it's a syllabary because of the number of types of character. So, for example, if you get 100 types of character, that's a little too big for an alphabet. It's probably syllabic signs. But again, great uncertainty to do with it. Um, Evans thought it was derived from linear A, but the chronology appears difficult. It's too short. Uh, various other proposals have been made. People talk about Etruscan, partly because the Etruscans said they came from that part of the world, and some ancient people believed they came from that part of the world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So once again, um, no definite decipherment that's met with scholarly approval. I expect most people have not seen this script before. It is called the Byblos Syllabary, and there are only 10 inscriptions found that use this script, written on bronze or on stone. They are dated to the second millennium BCE. As their name suggests, they come from Byblos, an ancient city in what is now Lebanon. Yes, these are people we commonly call Phoenicians, but this isn't the Phoenician alphabet. It has some similarities, but not enough to be able to read it. Let's see what Mark thinks. What do you know about the Biblos syllabary, and um, are we any closer to deciphering that? It's, um, they were mainly excavated in the early to mid 20th century. And they've been extensively published and written up. And there are examples of that script found quite a distance away including in Egypt and Italy. So the people who used that script got around or they traded or whatever, uh, but no one can read the actual text. Um, the characters were made by hammering chisels into the metal. They weren't done by scratching. So it's again, a bit like the Festos disc. It's rather unusual in terms of the manufacturing method of it. Mm -hmm. um, some of the signs look like modified Egyptian hieroglyphs. Some look like the um, alphabetic or semi-alphabetic letters of Phoenician. Um, it's thought that, that it's probably syllabic because there are, um, well, some say there's 190 types, some say there's only 114, but both of those figures are in the range where it's probably a syllabic. But once again, we don't know what the words actually are. We don't know what the language in question actually is. And if we got larger bodies of data, we might have more chance. Do you recognize this ancient script? This is what is called the Indus Valley script. Since the 1870s, when the first example was published, some 4,000 of these inscriptions have been found. They come from the Indus Valley civilization, which thrived in the period 2600 to 1800 BCE. 
Although the corpus of inscriptions is large, the inscriptions themselves are quite short, averaging about five signs, which makes deciphering the script extremely difficult. If we could read these, what would they tell us? Perhaps because of their brevity, not much, but you never know. Let's check in with Mark to get his thoughts. You had mentioned that the Indus Valley script has over a hundred possible decipherments. <laughs> Is that right? Um, what are some of the more interesting ones? And do you think any are on the right track? The, the main issue in that, in, in connection with the Indus Valley script, well, one issue was that it may not even be a script. It may not be a true script. Uh, the longest of the, the inscriptions is only 17 characters, and the average is less than 10. And this means that if those, even if, if those are whole words, these are very short inscriptions. If they are syllables or, or individual phonemes, they're even shorter. And it's been suggested that this is more like a, a cross linguistic system, like traffic lights or the iconic signs for female and male toilets and that kind of thing. Where are you not persuaded any... by that? Uh, I think, think I think there's, there's, there's some some possibility in this. It is very it is hard to see how you could have a sustained script with such short inscriptions where there's nothing beyond that. You know, no one ever felt moved unless there are larger texts which are lost, which is, of course, always possible. The other issue is that there's a big political issue with the Indus Valley script. Yeah. In India, there's a great deal of, of tension between speakers of northern Indian languages, Indic, Indo-European languages like Hindi, and the Dravidian languages of the south, which were clearly there before the Indic languages were introduced into northern India. But many of the Indic speakers want to claim that they're of much longer standing than we think they are. Mm -hmm. And they would like to say that the Indus Valley civilization was an Indic-speaking civilization and that the language is a bit like, say, an ancestor of Sanskrit, something like that. But the Dravidians say, no, 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 it's an early Dravidian language. And in fact, there is still one Dravidian language spoken in Pakistan. And they will say, oh, this is, this is a leftover from that time when the whole area was Dravidian speaking. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and the trouble is, as with many of these cases, these political issues, and sometimes religious issues as well, color the discussion. Have you found this to be true with, with other um, scripts that haven't been deciphered, uh, uh, where, they're, where there's modern interests that uh, uh, sway the discussion? Or is that um, this kind of a, a unique situation? Well, I mean, it's occurred, for example, with Ronga Ronga, the Easter Island script, which some people actually have claimed is related to the Indus Valley script. Have you ever seen these glyphs before? They come from Easter Island, or Rapa Nui. About two dozen wooden objects bearing these symbols have been found there. And from what we can tell, they are written from left to right, but from bottom to top. Some still think these may just be symbols, but they sure look like writing to me. They are called Rongo Rongo glyphs. Tablet Q is the only one that has been carbon dated, and it comes out to 1680 CE. A couple of others are written on European ores, so they must be from the 18th or 19th century. But no one knows, not even the present day inhabitants of the island, how to read them. The thing is, there's no other writing that we know of, native writing in Polynesia. The, um, and many people have, have tried to argue that uh, it is connected with a, a general Polynesian civilization that was otherwise illiterate or only semi-literate. And this, it's been adopted by Polynesian activists to some degree in that respect. People wanting to claim that Polynesia was a really important ancient entity. And there's some philological stuff as well. There's the word for the sweet potato, which some people think was transplanted from Ecuador by Polynesians and so on. Um, but then there are other people who have other completely different theories, and often it's because of their own predilection, their own desire for something to be of a certain type. It, Rongo Rongo also gets mixed up in, in a religious issue in that a lot of missionaries in the 19th century destroyed many of the tablets, thinking they were devices of the devil. Oh. And so the people who support Rongo Rongo will often pick on that as a sign of bias against it or against the relevant civilization. But it is striking way out there in the mid-Pacific, where there's no other native writing. Have you laid eyes on this writing before? It comes from the Kingdom of Kush in Eastern Africa, and it is known as the Meroitic script. 
It's derived from Egyptian hieroglyphs and Egyptian demotic, a cursive script. Surviving inscriptions date between the 1st century BCE and the 5th century CE. The script has been deciphered partly. We can reconstruct sounds, but not much is known about the Kushite language itself, and we cannot read the inscriptions very well at all. It's interesting because we do know some of the languages from that area, right? Um, mm. But Meroitic is, is, has given us some trouble. Meroitic, sometimes called Kushitic because of the kingdom of Kush, um, mainly in very late Egyptian times, um, 300 BCE and going on into the common era. Two forms of an alphabet. It does seem to be an alphabet, small number of, char of character types. Um, but it's poorly understood. Uh, a lot of the words seem to be cited in Egyptian text, starting in the Middle Kingdom and going through to the Roman period. And there are later Nubian and other such languages, and Meroitic might be related to those languages. Uh, it might be Nilo-Saharan, it might be Afro-Asiatic. Nubian itself is a dubious concept in terms of hard knowledge. Um, and what is often given as Nubian is typically reconstructed from later forms. So someone, some text will give you, there's a text by a French scholar giving you all kinds of meanings for words, such as the numbers one to 10 and so on. And this leads people to think, oh, we actually know some Nubian. But what we know is typically a lot later than the period that, where the main focus of interest is. Mm -hmm. uh, when they were involved with the Egyptian Middle Kingdom and the New Kingdom and later. Um, so, um, and it's a different language. Uh, Nile Saharan is not the same language family as Egyptian anyway. Egyptian is Afro-Asiatic. So it's hard to work out on the basis of Egyptian what the forms might mean. And the, the main scholar who worked on the language families of that part of Africa, Greenberg, um, his work's been heavily criticized. And some people think Nilo Saharan is just a wastebasket for languages he couldn't otherwise place. Oh. That there's nothing particular to it. And the arguments go on. Um, but uh, it's a very interesting language, Nubian. But again, we know it mainly from later. And there could have been a lot of change in that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, would you say that this is one of those uh, scripts uh, that were maybe the closest to cracking? Or um, yeah, yeah, because yeah, we have yeah. some knowledge of, yeah, of you yeah. know what came later. I think we've got more chance with that, and I think if people and that's that's shown from the fact there's a lot of research on it by competent people who probably wouldn't be doing it if they thought there was little chance. Some of these these scripts are characterized by the fact that almost all the work is done by amateurs who've got an enthusiasm about some proposed solution. But if you find something like this, because it, there seems to be some chance of deciphering it properly, more serious scholars are involved in, do, in working on it. Take a look at this one. Can you guess where it comes from? This is from the Iberian Peninsula. We call it the Southwest Paleo-Hispanic Script, and there are about 95 inscriptions, which date to the 7th and 6th centuries BCE, and come mostly from burials. Some people associate the script with the civilization of Tartessos, spoken about in Greco-Roman writings. But the inscriptions come from an area somewhat outside the Tartessian cultural zone. This Southwest Paleo-Hispanic script is one that not a lot of people have heard about, um, but it's pretty fascinating too. Uh, what can you tell us about that? The script um, is used to write an unknown language, which has been called Tartessian, because the word Tartessus applies to a location in that area. And inscriptions have been found all around the southwestern part of the Iberian Peninsula, in the south of what's now Portugal, but also in Spain. Uh, the name of the script is controversial because some people think it wasn't the language of Tartessus, it was some other place, and Tartessus is a misnomer. The, there are Greek and Roman sources which seem to locate that the the speakers of this language in areas where various steles were found. But it's still very suspect in the sense we don't know what the language is. We're guessing what any word might mean. And you'll sometimes say, oh, this is a place name, but that's because you don't know what other word it could be. And it's hard to prove whether it was a place name or not. It was easier in Crete because the place names had stayed the same more or less. So you have a form like Konosso, and it appears to be Knossos the main center of the 
than my own civilization. There's nothing quite as precise as that with the Paleo Hispanic. Yeah, yeah. Can you identify this script? This is the writing of the Zapotec culture of the Oaxaca Valley in Mesoamerica, which was used mostly between the 5th century BCE and the 7th century CE. The center of their culture was the ancient city of Monte Alban. The script has been found primarily on stone monuments. So we have this Zapotec script. Mm. Um, yeah. And we, we uh, obviously we've had a long history of having difficulty uh, deciphering glyphs from Mesoamerica. Well, mm. progress has been made on the Maya script, right? Mm. Um, uh, what is the case now with the Zapotec script? I think one thing one has to remember about those Central American scripts is that even with Mayan, for a long time, there were rival theories about how it should be interpreted in terms even of the type of characters they were. Coe and Thompson had a long running battle as to how to interpret Maya. And in the end, it turned out that Coe was much nearer the truth, but it wasn't an obvious thing at all. And here we've got something with smaller number of, of inscriptions. We've got, again, nothing like the Rosetta Stone. It's mainly read from top to bottom, as far as we can see, the way it's set out in the mm -hmm. inscriptions. Uh, and some people think it's, uh, they find its execution is cruder than that of the Mayan script, which suggests that precise values may have not been important. It may not have been very phonetically significant. Um, there are claims that it was a logosyllabic system, which means a mixture between the characters representing whole words and representing syllables. We do find that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, may have been developed for an ancient version of, of Zapotecan languages. But of course, the European colonizers suppressed a lot of these languages to a large extent. So what we've now got for Zapotecan is much later. A long period has elapsed between these inscriptions and modern Zapotec. Uh, so you would like to fill that gap in, but it's very, very hard to do so. It may never be possible to do so. So once again, um, there are extended texts, but it's not clear how they should be read. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's funny because, you know, we, we, we think to ourselves as archeologists or historians might think like, if we could just find an inscription, we would know what happened or whatever. But we often find inscriptions and we still can't know because we can't read it. <laughs> I mean, there, there are some people who, who clearly are aware of this who are not themselves historical linguists. There's a wonderful piece in one of Isaac Asimov's science fiction novels about the decipherment of Etruscan. And he clearly was aware that just because you get a body of text, it doesn't mean you now somehow magically understand it. But there are people who talk as if you do. There are people who say, I just sat down and looked at it for hours and the meaning came to me. And they sometimes don't even say what language they think it was in. They look at the script directly and somehow divine meaning from it. And clearly, uh, yeah, that... I, I take it you don't put a lot of stock into those kinds of things. No, no, no. You, you, <laughs> I mean, if, if someone thinks that, they really need to argue that very very strongly, and I've never seen such an argument. A lot of non-linguists don't fully grasp the difference between a, a script and a language anyway. Mm -hmm. And they don't realize that having read a script or being able to pronounce the characters in a script does not mean that you know what language it is, does not mean you know what the grammar's like or the pronunciation or anything like that. Like we were uh, but, talking about with linear A, where, you know, if you yeah. use the sounds, oops, if you use the sounds, uh of linear a of, of linear b with linear a doesn't mean you can read it <laughs> right if you yeah. try to read it as greek it's it, it doesn't read as greek mm -hmm. um the, the the one striking case is the cascajal block which was is a tablet size serpentinite slab it was found by chance near Veracruz in mexico in the 1990s it was found by laborers who then moved it and thereby destroyed the environment in which it was found so that was unfortunate um, but it appears to be 900 BCE from, from the surrounding artifacts. And if it's real, it's the earliest known writing in the Americas. So it's quite significant. Yeah. Um, and people have said it's near the Olmec heartland. But the Olmec script itself has not been authoritatively deciphered. And there's a lot of amateur claims about it. So, for example, some Afrocentrists, such as Clyde Winters, claim it, it, it represents the African Vi writing system. Michael Shu has proposed its links with Chinese characters and so on. So uh, Olmec itself is by no means uncontroversial. 
Um, the Cascajal block has 62 alt altogether unfamiliar symbol tokens. And it's written in a peculiar direction for that area. But again, it's so short. Unless we get a parallel text, unless we get larger bodies of this, and it could conceivably be a forgery. But we don't think it is. We don't really know. And, and um, so that's a striking case, a bit like the Festos disk, a single object, out of context, really. But you know roughly that part of the world, of course, but that doesn't necessarily help. There are some scripts that were once famously unreadable, but in recent times have been largely deciphered. Some people might still not know about the progress that has been made on them. So I thought I would discuss a couple of them with Mark. Well, let's talk about some scripts that uh, we're getting closer to being able to fully read. Okay, we've made some progress on, uh, especially in more recent times. And uh, the first one would be the Etruscan script. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how, that, how we've been kind of chipping away at that one? Well, there's never been any serious doubt about how to pronounce that script, the words of that script, because it's in a modified Greek alphabet. The whole of Central and Southern Italy used modified Greek alphabets, one of which is the Roman alphabet that was used for Latin and which we now use and many languages use. Um, and we also get a certain amount of glossing in Latin texts as to what an Etruscan word might mean. Uh, we we knew, knew for a long time that the Etruscan name for themselves was Racena. So if we see that word, we know it, it's referring to the Etruscan people. Um, a lot of the inscriptions are very short. Many of them are gravestones. And it's relatively easy to work out what an inscription on a grave might mean. Um, then, there are people, then there are people who are trying to take it further. And they're looking for links with languages often outside Italy. I mentioned the Aegean. Some other one person believes that Etruscan is connected with the Georgian languages at the east end of the Black Sea, and in particular with one such language called Laz. Um, the Festos disk itself has been read in, as Etruscan. So the, the progress that's actually agreed upon is quite small. Uh, you know, we, we don't we don't have a long text that really makes sense. We do have clauses that seem to make sense. So we're probably getting there. And I think the more, more inscriptions are found and the more serious work is done on them, there is some chance that sooner or later we'll be able to read Etruscan fluently. But if they're mostly gravestones and things like that, it won't be very exciting. Not like history that, books or something, yeah. And, and, that, and that's what happens in the Isaac Asimov story. The texts themselves are really boring. And the exciting thing is the fact they could read them, yeah. not what the content was. Yeah. No epic <laughs> poems, no history, nothing, no, nothing like that, you know. Yeah. Now, similarly, we've uh, made uh, quite a bit of progress in the last couple of decades on the Maya script. Mm. Um, how far along on that are we and how, how much do we have to go? I, I think um, that's, that's one of the big success stories. But it was it was used over quite a wide area, so there were some inconsistencies in the in the spellings and so forth, uh, and that would make sense if you think about a language like English that's used over a very wide area. The English that you speak is not the same as what an Australian would speak, and so forth. So that we do expect a degree of variation, and we don't have the socio linguistic information in the case of Mayan about that necessarily. But although there are lots of doubts, I mean, there are doubts with linear B as well with some particular tablets. We do have, I think, quite a, a, a success story to report with, in respect of Mayan. Um, the, the really frustrating place, of course, is South America because there's no writing at all in pre-colonial South America. There are those quipu things, which are assemblies of string, but they appear to be mainly mathematical in terms of the information although some people now think otherwise. And it, it really brings it home to you when you think about the Inca civilizations, for example, if only they had had writing, how much more we would, or we might understand. Yeah. But we don't, they didn't. And uh, my, my and they did, they wrote extensively. And we are increasingly familiar with the kind of message they were putting across. Another one with which we recently had a significant breakthrough is the linear Elamite script. This writing was used to write the Elamite language in southern Iran in the late 3rd and early 2nd millennium BCE. While we can read Elamite cuneiform, which comes slightly later, this one, for the longest time, we could not. But the discovery of eight inscribed silver beakers in 2018 
enabled specialists to make considerable headway on its decipherment. Finally, I chatted with Mark a bit about the amateur tradition of attempting to decipher ancient scripts, which is particularly popular in America. I was especially interested in some of the more outlandish theories. Okay, so this is where we get into some of the fun stuff. <laughs> um, we want to talk about some of the more out there ideas, right, that come from uh, some Americans. So can you tell us a little bit about that? There's quite a big um, amateur tradition in North America, uh, Canada, as well as the United States, uh, of finding, as it were, inscriptions in old world languages in, in the United States, in fragmentary bits of clay, of rock, whatever it may be. And the biggest name is Howard Barraclough Fell, known as Barry Fell, uh, who died a while ago, but his, his son and others continue this tradition. And they believe that there are inscriptions in the Americas written in versions of old world languages and scripts going back a long way. Chinese, Celtic, Egyptians, Libyans, Phoenicians, Hebrew, etc., etc. They don't leave anyone out, I guess. Huh? They don't leave many people out. <laughs> and um, Fell, in, Fell in particular was interested in Irish Ogham script, which is a very simple looking script. It's quite easy to convince yourself that you're looking at Ogham when what it is is not, in fact, script at all. Um, mainly used to write Irish Gaelic. Um, but um, he identified, for example, uh, inscriptions that he said were written in a North African variant on Ogham in North African languages, Berber languages, for example. And then you've got a big list of, of inscriptions of this kind um, from all over the United States and Canada, allegedly written in this language or that language. Um, Fell got interested in alleged hieroglyphs used to write Mi'kmaq, which is a, a language used in, in Nova Scotia and that sort of area. Um, I went to see some of those people. They denied all knowledge of this matter. Uh, but um, one, of the, one set of claims is about the Norse penetrating into North America in medieval times. Many people will have heard of the Kensington Stone from Minnesota which is, is apparently written in runic Scandinavian and dates itself 1362 CE. And the claim is that a band of Vikings forged westward from the settlements near Greenland, in, say in Newfoundland, where we know the Vikings were in Newfoundland, at the site at Lanceau Meadow was well established. Um, and then they, they were eventually massacred by local Native Americans and they left this inscription before the last ones were massacred. And people disagree. Most informed commentators think it's a 19th century forgery. There's a lot of Scandinavian people in that area now, but a few do accept it as genuine. And then there's the Yarmouth stone from Nova Scotia. And there's a photograph of me patting this stone. And I thought of souveniring it, but it weighs 400 pounds. That might not have been easy. <laughs> uh, it's got a very short inscription on it, 13 characters in runic, but in runic script, but not in Norse, so it doesn't read as Norse. And people have translated it in all kinds of ways. One person thinks it's Hungarian written left to right. Another thinks it's Hungarian written right to left, which did happen at one time. Of course, with completely different meanings, even though they're both supposed <laughs> so, to be Hungarian. You can read Hungarian, but either way. Uh -huh. Either way. <laughs> and, and so on, uh, various other things of that kind. Um, so, so there's plenty of this. Uh, and according to some people, there was a rich history of Europeans and Africans and so forth settling the United States well before the Vikings, certainly well before the Spanish and, and the English and so forth. Uh, and and um, But the evidence does not seem to convince anyone. It is very easy to think you have got a series of characters. And especially if you then start saying, oh, well, it wasn't actually that Norse word. It was a variant on that Norse word. <laughs> just, we, just kind of, of fudging to make it fit, right? So, yeah. so yeah, if, if you can give yourself untold amounts of leeway. And uh, in the end, there's no way to prove you wrong. You're too open-ended. You need to have some means of testing how likely it is. Mm -hmm. Even even if you don't have historical supporting data, you could at least get linguistic evidence. So if we got a crystal clear inscription, uh, which could be carbon dated or uh, thermoluminescence dated or whatever it might be, and it clearly was a thousand BCE, and it clearly was in a European language, 
then that would make us sit up and think. But mm -hmm. nothing like that is available. Nothing at that level has been found. And in many cases, there are political ramifications. A lot of Afrocentrists believe that African languages were taken and used in inscriptions in Central America and other such places. And they use this as part of their claim for a vastly important early African diaspora. And they've, they've struggled to convince anyone or anyone with, with the relevant specialist knowledge. Uh, tell me about this uh, Burroughs Cave. Yes, Burroughs Cave is a decidedly controversial site in Illinois. And in 1982, a large quantity of cultural material was allegedly found there by Russell Burroughs, hence the name of the cave. And some of the, his followers think some of the markings on these objects are epigraphic in nature. Some claim they have surprisingly accurate maps. Now, there is a long tradition of people claiming accurate maps that are out of place. The Piri Reis Turkish map is probably the most famous of these maps. Uh, also, thousands of stone tablets bearing texts, coins, um, and so on. And the, the, the outsiders who've looked at this are not persuaded by this material. Um, what uh, Two scholars, writers, claim that this is vulgar Latin written in an Etruscan alphabet. Others claimed Hebrew and Egyptian writing from this cave. Uh, and there's a theory that these are refugees from Ptolemaic Egypt, including a Jewish contingent from the Roman kingdom of Mauritania. One other person says, no, it's not that, it's Sanskrit. And I found Sanskrit in Peru as well, he says. So wow. this, is, this is a real hotbed, a real, real hornet's nest of peculiar interpretations. And uh, some of the, the people who found these or allegedly found them are very jealous about people being allowed to examine them closely. Oh. As if, as if they're scared that it'll be shown that it's a fake or something like uh -huh. that. But I mean, I will not say it could not be, but it's certainly an interesting cave. If all these different civilizations ended up in the same cave in Illinois, <laughs> it, it, it seems yeah. a slightly odd scenario. But, but uh, do you, do you personally tend to believe it might be a forgery? or these might be forgeries, or just misinterpreted? I, I think there's probably a mixture of the two. I think once once people get enthusiastic, they're, they're sometimes likely to, 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 to forge things. And indeed, even in mainstream scholarship, there were cases of people having fudged the data, shall we say, at least. You know, they, got very, they were very determined to believe that this was an example of so-and-so. So they would read things in a tendentious way they wouldn't allow for other possible readings. Mm -hmm. But in the amateur world, that is absolutely rife, obviously. And, and there are many people who, who want to believe that the ancestor of their first language was very influential. It was the ancestor of all human languages. It was part of a huge civilization that went all around the world in ancient times, populating different places, and everything is, is drawn to that. Um, I once was involved in a conversation between two people who claimed that all one claimed that all languages come from Basque and the other claimed they all come from Turkish. And they were on the same bulletin board with me and I got them bickering in the end. Each was calling the other a complete <laughs> idiot. How can you possibly believe that your sacred Basque is actually only corrupt Turkish? No, it's the other way around, you fool. I've and, gotten and comments, I, similar comments on my channel of hmm. all different all different languages. Uh, hmm. Yes. Um, so it's interesting, yeah. The, 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 the last bit I was going to mention is, is these um, individual manuscripts, which have not been deciphered, although they appear to be, of course, relatively recent in most cases. Like the You've Voynich manuscript? The Voynich manuscript, which is held at Yale University. And uh, I never managed to get in to see that. I must have another go. But uh, it's a, it's a book-length work. It appears to be medieval, although some people say it's a, a forgery only 200 years old. Um, it's written in an unknown script, in an unknown language. There are illustrations of plants, and the topic might be botanical. But once again, lots of different interpretations of it. And every few years, someone says, I have proved that this is the correct interpretation of the Voynich manuscript. Then there is the Rohontz Codex, which is a Hungarian document. Hungary keeps coming up. Yeah. And the reason it keeps coming up is because it's not quite an isolated language, but it's a language of mysterious origin. It's distantly related to Finnish and Estonian, but the speakers seem to have moved from much further east. Although some people say, oh, no, they were always there. 
always in modern Hungary, you know. I've, I've heard it, of the Hun interpretation. Oh, yeah, they're it, from Mongolia yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, they certainly appear to have been from Siberia, at least. And what's interesting is that genetically, they're almost indistinguishable from the surrounding Slavs, which suggests that there was a small elite population who eventually managed to impose its own language, but mixed genetically with the surrounding population. So Hungarian has always been flavor of the month in cases like this. Basque is another one. And the discussion of the Rohans Codex, uh, again, an unknown writing system. It appears to be written right to left, and Hungarian was at one time written right to left. Um, it could be a hoax. People, some people think it's written in Hindi. There's all kinds of different interpretations of it. So there, there you are. I mean, there, there, are, there are many other stories and arguments and theories about mysterious, ancient, or more modern. I'd like to hear... Documents. Yeah, I'd like to hear a little yeah. bit about um, Richard Sharp Sh uh, Shaver. Ah, yes. <laughs> now, this is, the, this is the, the Shaver mystery. And many people tell this story without reference to the linguistic element in it. But in fact, the linguistic element was pretty basic. Um, Richard Shaver presented a, um, an a alleged surviving fragments of an ancient language and script. And he'd come upon an article in Science World from 1936 claiming that six letters of the Roman alphabet historically represent concepts as well as sounds. And he then decided that all the letters of the Roman alphabet, as well as their sounds, carry a hitherto, a hitherto undiscovered meaning. A single letter has a meaning. Mm -hmm. And he offered this magazine to the science, this, this material to the science fiction magazine, Amazing Stories, to be saved for posterity. And Ray Palmer, who was the editor, was intrigued by this and published a lot of material like this. And this is the story of the Dero and the Tero, the, the evil Dero who live underground and send out bad vibes to everyone on the surface and love torturing people and causing disasters. And the good ones, the Tero, who try to combat them. And all this involves a big disaster involving the sun in quite recent times. So they reject the standard account of the history of the solar system. And it, he ended up going on about rock art as well, Shaver, towards the end of his career. But the is idea he, is, is, he, is, is, is... Did he himself believe this was real or was he, he... He thought he was making up fiction and then other people took it as real? I, my impression is that he did believe at least some of it and the fiction was then based on it. I mean, Palmer told him to represent it as fiction for the purpose of a science fiction journal. And it, it was quite a hit in, in, in that respect. But it, it, can, it, it contains wonderful things. For example, in Shaver's system, which is called Mantong, that the language or the script is called Mantong, the word trocadero, he says, is T for good, Rho for one, C for C, A for A, D for D, which is bad and row for row. And trocadero therefore means good one, see a bad one. And this is why it's used as a name for theatres, because apparently spectators in theatres are good and actors are bad. So when you're in a theatre, there's, a, there's good people seeing bad people. And that's where this are <laughs> wow. completely ignoring the etymology that we have for the word. And this is another feature of all these people. They frequently ignore established etymologies. They don't even say, I think the established etymology is wrong. They disregard it completely. Mm -hmm. And so I found the true meaning of this. And then you'll say, ah, but we think it derives from that. Oh, well, you know, big deal. You know, I am right. You are wrong. But they haven't looked at it beforehand. No, I see. Yeah. Very interesting. And all this is uh, recounted in your book? A lot of this is in my book, Strange Linguistics, 2013, um, by uh, Lincoln Europa in Munich. Check it out, um, everybody. Check it out. Uh, I'd be happy to discuss the matter with people. You, David has my email address, obviously. Uh, there's plenty more. There's plenty more. But this has been the, the part of it to do with mysterious ancient scripts and the like. And there's a lot more besides that. Great, great. I, I have a couple more questions. Just uh, mm. I might put them in somewhere else. But yeah, um, sure. of all the uh, scripts that are undeciphered, which do you think are the the um the biggest like the most important that we we need to crack um that will give us the most information historical information or benefit us the most in some way i would like to see indus valley script deciphered if it is a script 
because we don't know very much about that civilization. They appear to have been a very peaceful civilization. They didn't don't seem to have fought wars much or had an extensive military caste. Uh, but the, since we can't read their writing, we can't confirm that in terms of anything they actually say. Mm -hmm. And it's a big civilization. These big cities of Harappa and Mohenjo-daro in what is now Pakistan. And they traded with, with, with Sumeria and, and, and that part of the world, Mesopotamia. And it, I suppose it's possible that Rongo Rongo really is connected with them, although I doubt that. But on any account, they were a big civilization. And like the Inca, we can't, in the case of the Inca, there's nothing to read. In the case of the Indus Valley, it's very frustrating. There's quite a lot to read, and we can't read it. And it would be nice. It might also help us to know at what date Indic speakers came into North India. The Indian right, yeah. came into North India. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is a big political thing, of course, but it, it would be interesting to get solid evidence as to what language this is and what the Indic speakers might have been doing at that time. So I would like that if I was if I was able to have a successful <laughs> wish for one of these to be deciphered, I would go for the yeah. Valley Civilization in the Valley script. I, I think I'm with you there. And of, of all the uh, undeciphered scripts, which one or ones do you think are the most likely to be deciphered? Well, I, I, you know, we've looked at things like Etruscan, which has been in part deciphered and, and always could be read anyway, could be pronounced anyway. And we've looked at Maya, which is the big success story. Um, so, I, and I suspect that, that Meroitic and that cluster involving Nubian, which again has been to some degree deciphered, um, that there's something going for that. What, one would, what would be useful is when you get multiple languages written in the same script uh, you know, like with the Rosetta Stone, where you where you had you had different languages on the same tablet, admittedly in different scripts, yeah. but at least you had a body of data in this language and that form and that language, and if, especially if the the same script was being used for more than one language, we might have more chance. But yeah. often you, you you're dependent on what data you get, right? You got the Festos disk. Nothing like that's been found since. No, I, saw yeah. it, I saw it in 1971 and stood staring at it in amazement. It would be lovely to have five or six or ten of those. Oh, yeah. To see what you could do, you know. And uh, so we wait, maybe someone will find a big case of texts. In 1939, the American archaeologist Carl Blagan was working in Pylos in Crete, and he knew the war was coming. So he was pretty urgent, and he dug one trench in it right through a room full of documents. And that was the first, he and his student dug that. And, and that was mm -hmm. the first dig they made on that site. And it all had to be gathered up and put in storage because oh, yeah. the war happened. So they were lucky there. Yeah. And you, that might happen again. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. it will. Hopefully it will. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, thank you so much, Mark, for uh, joining me today and telling us more about these scripts. Uh, and I look forward to uh, many more of them uh, being uh, deciphered. So. Thank you. Thank you for your interest, David. It's been very good dealing with you in this respect. It's wonderful. Thank you. I realize that some of you would have preferred me to go into more depth on some of these scripts, but this was just a survey and the video is rather long already. But if you want me to do a dedicated video on any one of these, let me know in the comments below. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to help the channel out, a super thanks would be much appreciated. You might like my little e-booklet, Why Ancient History Matters. It's designed to persuade people that the subject is important, even in the modern world. You might also wish to use it to help spread the word. So feel free to share it with someone you know. It's free for anyone who wants it. I've left a link in the description box below the video for you to grab a copy. Catch you later.